Hi guys! This is just a friendly reminder that if you are a child, you should not be watching this video. Okay, and proceed! So, Metalocalypse. Adults from cartoon about the richest, most famous entertainment act on the planet, a death metal band called Death Clock. Their actions are observed by a mysterious tribunal, and they just so happen to be actual gods prophesized long ago to be the ones to save the world from the titular Metalocalypse. Who is Death Clock? If four words could describe every member, they would be talented, out of touch, childish, and dumb. Individually, they are Nathan Explosion, lead singer, lover of all things dark and brutal, but is not above treating his bandmates as younger brothers or surrogate children. According to his dating profile, he likes metal, he likes chips, and that's it. Speaking of dating, he stands out as the only member of Death Clock interested in a long-term relationship, which leads to him winding up with girls who are abusive or even outright murderous. Squizgar Squiggle. Fastest guitarist in the world, he plays lead for Death Clock. He stands out as the in-universe most attractive member of the band, the tallest, the most experienced, the most vain, and the most inept at anything other than playing his instrument. He is often referred to himself and by others as a god because of his own massive ego and his unmatchable talent. Toki Wartuk, rhythm guitarist, the newest and most naive member of the group, he is noticeably emotionally stunted, he's surrounded by an aesthetic of bright colors, animals, and happy faces. William Murderface, the in-universe ugliest Death Clock member, he's spoiled, self-loathing, short-tempered, and incredibly insecure. Pickles the Drummer, he stands out as the oldest member of Death Clock, and the only one who was well-known before Death Clock, being the lead singer and guitarist of the glam metal band Snakes and Barrels. There's a few other characters who are important, like their manager, Charles Foster Oftenson, um, Toki's friend, the washed-up rock star, Dr. Roxo, the rock and roll clown, and, of course, the Tribunal. How do I describe the Tribunal? The Tribunal are a group of various powerful people from various factions who are watching Death Clock and keeping tabs on them, interpreting their actions, and each member of the tribunal kind of has their own motivation for doing so. I think we should start by looking into the backstories of each of the Death Clock members. I think this would be a good place to start before we really dive deeper into the character. On a lot of shows, but especially this genre, the backstories are rather inconsequential. They don't use them to inform the personality of the character. I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them are like this. The one that really sticks out to me as an example is Lois Griffin from Family Guy. Her backstory is that she comes from a very wealthy family, but this has no effect on her character. Coming from this background doesn't affect her day-to-day -day life. She could have any backstory and it wouldn't matter. She'd still be the same nagging housewife. On Metalocalypse, however, each character's backstory very clearly plays into their personalities. Their childhoods all shape them into the people they are now in ways that not only make sense, but tell us more about the characters. Every member of Death Clock comes from an abusive upbringing. Except for Nathan. Fucking love my dad. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. Murderface is the one we know the least about, but what we do know is that he was orphaned as a baby when his father killed his mother with a chainsaw and then himself. He was raised by his grandparents, and given the way Stella Murderface treats him as an adult, we can infer things were much the same while he was growing up. Pickle's parents have always favored his older brother Seth over him. No matter what he does, he can never earn their approval, whereas Seth can do no wrong despite his numerous failings. Pickles became an alcoholic during childhood when Seth burned down the garage and blamed him for it. He left home as a teenager and at age 16 became frontman of the band Snakes and Barrels. They rose to fame but soon disbanded due to drug problems. 
This is why Pickles is the most jaded and cynical of the group, but also will assume a maternal or older brother type role with his fellow band members. The inadequacy instilled in him often manifests itself through extreme jealousy. The two most notable examples would probably be when he is replaced by a drum machine while in rehab, and when Murderface took on the pet project of acting like a father towards Squizgar. Why is it always about Squizgar? He's not here and it's still about him! Okay. Okay. Come back here and argue with me! Come back, I was banned! I broke your phone, punish me! Which brings us to the blonde himbo himself. He is probably the most direct. We only ever get one actual flashback to him as a child, which is the story of how he found his first guitar. This few seconds shows us so much about why he is the way he is, why he is so attached to his guitar. It's practically a part of him. He uses it to relieve stress, he knows everything there is to know about it, to the point where he doesn't actually know about much else. Can you name something that has nothing to do with guitar? Go, 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 go. Uh, uh, the, the, oh, um, uh. Of course, there's another very important part of this flashback, but we're gonna talk more about that in a, another section. Finally, this brings us to Toki. Toki was severely abused, overworked, and isolated as a child. As an adult, he is extremely emotionally stunted, has a strong aversion to work, and constantly seeks attention, often by acting out the way a little kid would. Even though all of Death Clock are perpetual children, the others are mentally stuck at about age 14, whereas Toki acts more like a 10 year old, sometimes even younger. He's not entirely a child in an adult's body, but he comes very close to being that. He also sometimes experiences breaks from reality and emotional outbursts. Probably most memorable would be the time he possibly beat a man to death. Just like the other characters, Toki's personality goes hand in hand with his backstory. A backstory that is revealed gradually over time. We get little snippets throughout the series until we can pretty much map out his entire history from childhood up until joining Death Clock. Other shows that do this can sometimes get murky. For example, the character Rose Quartz from Steven Universe had an established personality and backstory, but when it was later revealed that her and another character called Pink Diamond were actually the same person the whole time, past events and personalities had to be retconned and reworked to make sense. Nothing that is revealed about Toki's past ever contradicts anything else, and when you put the events in sequential order, it all fits and makes sense. Toki's parents are first introduced as a mysterious reverend and his wife from a small village in Norway. Their presence causes Toki to become completely catatonic throughout the entire episode. A few episodes later, we see a flashback to Toki as a child being slapped across the face by his mother. The tribunal discussed Toki's inherent trust of clowns. In season two, Toki goes to visit his dying father where we see another flashback which shows more abuse. We see that Toki spent his days doing manual labor and was punished with beatings or isolation for the smallest of infractions. While locked in the punishment hole, Toki made himself a clown doll, which he believed protected him. This episode elaborates on facts we already knew, but it doesn't actually change anything. Finally, in the Doomstar Requiem, we learn that Toki left home as a teenager and lived on the streets before eventually being discovered by Death Clock at an open audition. Each Death Clock member was clearly shaped by events in their past into the people that they are in the present when the show takes place. As I mentioned during the intro, all of the members of Death Clock are literal gods, or demigods, depending on your interpretation. Each member represents different concepts and exhibits different powers. We can gather this information from what we can see happening. The insight of the tribunal, though it should be noted that the tribunal are not a totally reliable source and can and have been wrong. I see the families reunite. I see father killing son in the end, this ultimate brutality. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Song lyrics, visual motifs, and the prophecy itself. Death Clock themselves do not actually know they are gods, or that any of the strange events following them are supernatural in nature until the end of season 4. The closest we get is Squizgar. Squizgar is most often associated with the concepts of life and beauty. He's fathered hundreds of children, which isn't really much of a power, but the tribunal draws the parallel between Squizgar and Zeus, 
who of course impregnated many human women with demigod children. This whole idea probably would have come into play during the Metalocalypse itself had the series been allowed to get that far. Although Squizgar believes himself to be a literal god, coming to the conclusion that he was in Immaculate Conception, after being unable to track down his birth father, other characters often refer to him as a guitar god. Squizgar's talent in-universe is unmatched, the only person able to come even close being Toki. Squizgar is also said to be unearthly attractive and his beauty is never tarnished. Even while the other Deathclock members have visibly aged when compared to their younger selves, Squizgar looks identical. He is also completely irresistible. Now obviously being famous rock stars, finding a sexual partner is pretty fucking easy, but Squizgar is hands down the favorite of Deathclock groupies. His partners also expand far beyond their fan base. I mean, come on, how many of these grannies do you think are big Death Clock fans? I mean, I don't know, maybe they are. But it's a fact that Squizgar could have anyone he wanted simply by looking at them. Thematically and visually, we also see a lot of references to Norse mythology with this character. I will seize you in Valhalla. I've always hated you, Squizgar. Squizgar first took up the guitar when he happened upon it as a child. He walks in on his mother having sex with two men and runs from the house. He is chased by a pack of wolves, eventually falling down a hole. He finds the corpse of an unknown person and a Gibson explorer resting at the feet of a statue of Odin. The circle Squizgar lands on appears to be the Valknut, which represents Odin. Squizgar, of course, uses the instrument to harness his unmatchable skill and is rarely seen without the guitar in his hands throughout the series. This backstory draws upon a reoccurring narrative throughout Norse mythology. Skeggy of Midfirth broke into the grave mound of Herolful, Herolf Croc, Cracky, Herolf Cracky. Look, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce most of this shit. Like, just leave me alone, okay? And plunders um plunders a powerful magic sword called the Scoff Nun. Her Herbor recovers a cursed sword from her father's grave and frees herself from servitude. Squizgar similarly recovers his guitar from this temple and later concludes that he was in fact fathered by the gods. I was birthed from a specters, a ghost in the night. Could it be that the gods gave me my life? Wolves feature heavily in this episode. In Norse mythology, there were wolves that acted as guides, and Odin had two loyal pet wolves, Gary and Freki. I don't care if that's how it's pronounced, that's how I'm gonna say it, because that sounds cute. Gary and Freki. Toki is by far the easiest one of the guys to analyze. Toki represents death and is sometimes referred to as the angel of death. This power is really more of a curse though. Anyone he comes to love will die. His little girl fan, his guitar teacher, even his cat. Obviously death clocks themselves are immune to this. You could say their manager, Charles Oftenson, is immune as well, although he actually did die at one point. But we'll come back to that. Dr. Roxos never died either, but being Toki's friend certainly has brought him a lot of pain. Like Squizgar, Toki also draws a lot of thematic and visual parallels to mythology. And like Squizgar, this is tied to his cultural background. Being raised in some sect of Christianity, we see a lot of ties to Jesus with Toki. Some are pretty obvious, like Toki being whipped and having the scars on his back, being chained up in the crucifixion pose. In Doomstar, he and Abigail actually are put up on crosses, albeit upside down, which is actually how St. Peter was crucified. Also in Doomstar, the song Abigail Sings Toki is a reference to Everything's Alright from Jesus Christ Superstar. Nathan. I've seen a lot of people float the idea that Nathan represents power, and that totally makes sense. His mere presence and size is intimidating. He's also obviously accumulated a lot of power through influence and money. Nathan also represents chaos as chaotic and violent accidents follow him throughout his entire life. Nathan is also very clearly tied to the element of water. At the beginning of season one, he has the idea to record an album underwater. The sea creatures are naturally drawn to them and wind up being picked up on the album. 
The album itself was not even intended for humans, but as a gift to the creatures of the sea. It's for underwater sea creatures, therefore we will not play it for humans. And there is actually truth to this too. Research has shown that sharks and some other marine predators actually do enjoy the sound of death metal. The Death Water album caused mass suicides as the whales on the recording are communicating the message Go Into The Water, which is also one of the songs on the album. The whales are able to communicate prophetic messages to Nathan, and hearing these voices may be the reason he didn't speak until he was five years old. In season four, the whales cause Nathan mental anguish as they tell him that his new album is not communicating the right message. His emotional state over this seems to be what causes the massive storms that wind up destroying every copy of said album. Nathan then realizes Death Clock must go back underwater once more and record an album with the proper message. Furthermore, Nathan is tied to the concept of love. He is the only member of Death Clock to come from a loving family and the only member of Death Clock to desire a romantic relationship, besides Toki, briefly. We see him dating all throughout the series, and at the end of the Doomstar Requiem, he winds up with Abigail. Pickles and Murderface are a little harder to pin down. We don't see as many hints at their godhood as we do with the other three, but they are still there. Pickles is very hedonistic and impulsive, and unlike other characters, he rarely suffers consequences due to this. He has a superhuman-like immunity to the negative effects of drugs and alcohol. But Pickles is particularly hard to nail down because he seems to be the odd one out. For example, the other members represent opposite traits of one another. Squizgar is life and Toki is death, Nathan is love and Murderface is hate. I think with Pickles, he's sort of the id that keeps it all balanced. He's often described by fans as the mom of the band, and I think that element of his personality works into his role in the prophecy as well. Pickles and Murderface also have the least connection to their cultural backgrounds. Speaking of Murderface, he is the god of misery and hatred. He revels in the negative emotions of others, exhibits extreme self-hatred, and his presence alone causes anguish and misery for those around him. He seems to believe he was the cause of his father's murder-suicide, and his presence is what gives the band their dark sound. With Murderface briefly fired, they were only able to write happy songs. Every time Death Clock plays live, some kind of horrific accident happens which kills or injures large amounts of people. Something Death Clock fans are well aware of, signing injury waivers at the entrance of each show. Death Clock employees have no better luck. The very first episode, entitled The Curse of Death Clock, revolves around this fact and drops the first hint something supernatural may be going on. But what is the curse and what is the cause of it? One theory I've seen floated is that it's caused by Toki and his status as Angel of Death. I disagree with this because Toki's death curse works very differently. Anyone that Toki loves dies. But Toki does not love his fans, at least not collectively. Death Clock detests their fans, which is a running threat on the show. Also, the victims of Toki's curse do not die sudden and violent deaths like what happened to their fans and employees. Toki's victims all actually die quite peacefully from illness. The only exception being Toki's dad, who was dying of cancer, but Toki directly interfered by trying to carry him up a mountain. That is why I would draw your attention away from Toki and towards Nathan. Nathan's chaos motif fits much better. The violent accidents surrounding Death Clock fit better with the random gory events that follow Nathan through life. The truck that crashed into his third grade classroom, his girlfriend falling down the stairs into a coma after calling him Tonto. And very different people. Hold on for a f second, Tonto. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. But even more so than that, I think it has more to do with the sheer power Death Clock possesses. I think the mere fact of having five gods together is going to wreak a lot of havoc. They're obviously very powerful together. The introduction of Toki brought them instant and monstrous success. This, an apparent prophecy that I would become a character in. I would be known as the Dead Man. Because I had died, I was invisible to Celestia, the Half Man. What you must understand is that the Metalocalypse has been moving forward. These events have been foreseen that five souls would come to shepherd us through the darkest times known. Is that old guy supposed to be Santa Claus or something? Are we getting presents? What is happening here? So with all this talk of prophecies and gods, you're probably wondering, 
Well, what is the Metalocalypse? Well, it's an apocalypse of metal. Not like the music, like actual metal. We get hints of what this will actually entail, and by the end of the series, we see the very beginnings of it. Sometimes it changed. The air has begun to taste of metal. The whales they chant a constant warning. They keep singing and repeating. What we do see is a lot of the lead up to it, because the whole series is supposed to ultimately cultivate in a final season where the Metalocalypse takes place, but you know. Now, Brendan Small has two albums, Galacticon and Galacticon 2, and I could go over like all the theories on that and that tie it into the show, but to be honest, like I've heard both sides. I've heard people who say like, yes, clearly this is the ending that was always meant for Metalocalypse, you just can't legally come out and say that, but like that's clearly what it is. And then I've heard other people say like, no, 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 this is totally its own thing and it's totally unfair to make that connection because, you know, we should allow him to kind of release whatever he wants without tying it back to this one creation of his. So, and plus it's just like a whole other thing. So I'm just not going to get into it here. During the first season, the Tribunal discussed the fact that Death Clock needs to die in order to prevent the Metalocalypse from happening. A number of events have already occurred, which were all prophesized to lead up to the Metalocalypse. The Timeline. Death Clock is formed and signed to Crystal Mountain Records. Magnus Hammersmith is kicked out of the band and replaced with Toki Wartooth. Agent 216 is killed at Mordhouse. Death Clock performs the Death Water album live. The Metal Masked Assassin swears revenge on Death Clock for the death of his brother, Agent 216. Cardinal Ravenwood is killed, setting the Metalocalypse into motion. The anti-Death Clock terrorist group, the Revengeancers, pops up. Charles Oftenson is killed protecting Death Clock, but is brought back to life. Death Clock's new album is destroyed thanks to a prophetic message from the whales. Toki meets and befriends Death Clock's former guitarist, Magnus Hammersmith. Salatia reveals himself to Death Clock and kills the label head. Who is Salatia? Well, well, <laughs> I probably should have mentioned. His tribunal member, he has this thing called Project Falconback, it's important. He wants the Metalocalypse to happen, but he wants to kill Death Clock to prevent them from doing whatever they're specifically supposed to do. I mean, like a lot of the secrets, it never got a chance to be fully revealed, so. Toki is betrayed by Magnus, and he and Abigail are kidnapped by him. He's teamed up with the Revengeancers and the Metal Masked Assassin. Then, the Doom Star. What's the Doom Star? That's the Doom Star. What does it do? It does that. What's that? Those are the Death Lights, they're within Death Clock, they sing about it. Okay. Death Clock rescues Toki and Abigail, learning about humility and brotherhood along the way. So they are now ready to face the Metalocalypse, which of course, never happened. The show was put on hiatus. Adult Swim refused Hulu's offer to pay for and produce the final season. Adult Swim rejected Hulu's offer to fund the final season, and now there's like rumors going around that it could come back, but honestly, like, who the hell knows? <laughs> there are a few other things, but those are like the real important ones. At least as far as I could assess. I mean, I'll be honest, like, my strength is like characters and, and that kind of stuff. Like, when it comes to like prophecies and like, I'm not really good at that, so if I got anything wrong, like, I do apologize. I tried really hard. Okay, I am sick and tired of people saying that Murderface and Toki are useless, okay? First of all, as we've seen, they're foundational for the function of the band, but also, they're not untalented as some people would suggest. Toki can play, okay? That's made clear. He's just A, lazy and doesn't like to practice, he also doesn't know about the technical side of his instruments, so he sometimes says and does things that are stupid, but not because of a lack of talent. That's why he needs me a piano teacher! You mean guitar teacher. Murderface can also play. I mean, he can play in the bass with his dick. 
That takes talent, people! He's also incredibly lazy and would rather cut corners, but don't forget, Murderface and Toki wrote and recorded the song Taking It Easy. Also, when the band the two signed to Murder to the Records refused to work, Toki and Murderface created their entire album by scratch, all by themselves, in one night. So all you Toki and Murderface haters out there can just back off. So that is my video essay on Metalocalypse, and I know there's a ton more we could have gone over, but the video could only be so long, and <laughs> I mean, it's been like an entire month since my last upload, so maybe if there's enough, if there's enough interest we can do another video, do a follow-up and go over some of the other things we could have talked about, but that was kind of the stuff that I found interesting. So I hope you found it interesting too, maybe you learned some things you didn't know, I don't know, maybe I just kind of, I don't know, hopefully it was entertaining. Um, if you liked this video, please do subscribe, it helps so much, and I will see you guys next Saturday, okay!